Well, greetings, everyone. David Arendelle here. This is a talk which I gave uh, for the College Reading and Learning Association conference a couple years ago back in 2008. What I was asked to do was to try to identify what were some of the promising models in learning assistance and developmental education that would be helpful for us to take a look at as our individual programs are looking how should we transform ourselves to meet better needs for the future. And what I did is that, I, in a sense, I kind of took a tour across the United States looking at about a dozen programs, identifying what were some of their key features, and then trying to bring together to see what were the common uh, principles that seemed to guide these programs then. So my analogy is, is traveling across the United States and trying to pay attention to the road signs and what is it that we should be paying attention to. It seems like signs, whether they be on the road or looking at the professional literature or listening to others, seem to be terribly confusing. All of these are actual real highway signs that you might end up seeing. Some of us have experienced those and known how frustrating it was. And it seems like it's difficult to pick out the correct path. We have incomplete information. We don't have a lot of time. We don't have a lot of resources. And what we're trying to do in this presentation is try to be able to identify some exemplary programs and see if they've got something to tell us. And where does part of this uh, idea of this talk comes from? Well, it comes from one of the classic management books that's been written in the past quarter century, In Search of Excellence by Peters and Waterman, which really identified and really helped us to start better seeing on how let's pay more attention to what the best programs are doing. In this case, what were the finest businesses in America doing? And what we'll end up doing with this talk is taking a look at what are some of the finest programs in the United States doing regarding learning assistance and developmental education. So let's take our little road trip here, strap ourselves in. We've got quite a journey over the next few minutes to take a tour of. So in a sense, pretend that we're traveling along Highway 66 across the United States. And photos are appropriate. Well, the first program I want to take a look at is over on the far east coast, and that's Indiana University of Pennsylvania. A fine program here. It deals with 14,000 students. It's a public institution. They call theirs the Department of Developmental Studies. Some of the things that I think were really key about this particular program was the centralization in which they brought all the resources together. They are able to combine those into one simple location. They are able to carefully manage those. And if you've taken a look at some of the research from the National Center for Developmental Education and the What Works book, which was published by Dr. Hunter Boylan and others, you'd see on how centralization oftentimes is highly correlated related with national studies for higher outcomes for students and higher student retention rates. Our next location we'll take a look at is Penn State. In terms here, very large institution, 34,000 students. Here they not only have a single learning center, they actually have a constellation of centers as you can see here. Math, writing, uh, teamwork, technology, supplemental instruction, and the rest. For them, it's this central location in which students are drawn into, and then they not only take advantage of the service that they came for, but also they notice there's other services which they could avail themselves of. So in a sense, it kind of becomes one-stop shop for students. Our next location we end up going to is once again in Pennsylvania. Here's the University of Pennsylvania. Lots of wonderful things about this center. The thing I want you to notice is it's a private institution, graduate programs. Look at the kinds of programs that are offered for their graduate students. So many times there are stereotypes among policymakers and administrators that learning assistance only really serves those first-year students that maybe are marginal. They've been admitted on, on um, um, permission. They really don't meet academic requirements, and that's why we end up providing services. But look at the kinds of services here which are being provided for the graduate students in dentistry, medicine, and the rest. Writing programs for them, mentorship programs for them, also providing them in strategies on how to be able to develop learning strategies at the graduate student level. 
For me, as I end up looking at this, it just reminds me that learning assistance is really about meeting the academic rigor of courses, and where that occurs at really doesn't make much difference if it's in the first year, in the senior year, or in graduate and professional school. Our next one is taking a look up at Rhode Island, small private institution. One of the things I think that's important about this one is look at the wide array of services which they provide. Disability services, advising, first year experience programs, and also traditional learning assistance services. As a result, as it says, nearly every single student use one or more of the services. For them, the Academic Center for Excellence, which I think is an interesting title, kind of communicates that this is really all about enhancement, development, regardless of whatever particular academic strengths that you might have. And I think, once again, it helps to place the learning center in the center of the campus since it's providing services for everyone. Our next campus to take a look at is Cornell in New York. Taking a look here, I think that one of the distinctions about Cornell, many things going on in its Center for Teaching and Learning, but notice that they also not only serve students, but also they serve faculty members. And look at the Center for Teaching Excellent and the kinds of things which they're providing. Professional development for faculty members. When I think about learning assistants and developmental educators, I think about the broad range of skills which they possess. They not only understand students and what their needs are, they also have great expertise in terms of the learning process. And I think that's the reason why at Cornell and other institutions across the United States, the learning assistance centers have broadened out. And they're not only serving students, but also faculty members as well. At St. Thomas, it's a four-year independent institution, relatively small in size, but look at the kinds of programs which they end up providing. Once again, it's this idea of comprehensiveness. At St. Thomas, notice that they have academic advising, peer tutoring, first-year experience courses, and other services. Bridge program is offered. Once again, at St. Thomas, the Academic Services Unit is central to the institution. It's not marginalized, located out on the far fringes of the campus, and viewed as only serving only those students who are least prepared, but actually you end up seeing a center which serves the majority of the students. At Harvard University, the first college founded in the United States, they have the Derek Box Center for Teaching and Learning. Once again, it's this idea of comprehensiveness. Not only are they providing services for students, and once again, think about this. We have a learning center at one of the most prestigious institutions in all of the United States. They understand that they still have higher expectations, even for these students who come in with very gifted and privileged backgrounds. So they end up providing those services, but also notice to what degree they also provide services for faculty members. And that's part of the reason why it's called the Center for Teaching and Learning. And I think, once again, the more that we can leverage our services to break out of our own, sometimes our own silos of only serving students, I think that we need to think about how can we be of service wider on the campus. Central Carolina Community College, two-year public institution. Notice here this way in which they have also gotten involved with online tutoring, among their other services. So they also understand that not only do they provide services physically on campus, but also we need to develop services to assist our growing population of online learners. In my own home state here of Minnesota, the Minnesota system of colleges and universities, their goal is to have 25% of all of their enrollment online within the next 10 years. The question comes down is, what are we going to do as learning assistants and developmental educators to be able to meet the need of those online students? Here we end up having another private institution, relatively small in size, Lee's McRae College. And I think the thing that I once again notice here is all these additional services. Oftentimes, you probably have noticed as we've been going through the slides here, that a number of these also have offices for disability services. 
Once again, I can't think of a group of people who are probably better skilled at being able to be part of a team for meeting students with disabilities than those in learning assistance and developmental education. But notice here this wider range, disability services, first year experience programs, summer orientation, and also being involved with student retention. I think too often times, we don't always get involved with the campus retention programs as leaders of our own centers and, and programs. I think we need to really start leveraging our talents more, and I think as a result of that, we'll be recognized, receive more resources, and given the opportunity to do what we really are good at, which is helping people to excel. Well, at Richmond College, we're down here in Texas at this point. Once again, notice it's the Center for Tutoring and Learning Connections. Interesting title. Two-year institution serving 12,000 students. What were some of those key factors in which they're able to meet the needs of students? Well, notice that not only do they offer semester-length courses, but notice the variety of modalities in which they're providing services to students. Traditional lecture, self-placed lab, computer-based, online, and also they're connected with the learning communities, which also perhaps you've noticed with several of the other examples, and I think you'll see with a couple more before we finish it up. There's been lots of great research. I think probably some of the recent research by Dr. Vincent Tinto has identified how it's absolutely essential that developmental level courses also be parts of learning communities that connect those students in those courses with several other rigorous courses. And that you end up seeing higher achievement and higher retention rates whenever students are involved in learning communities and also particularly helpful whenever you include a developmental level course for those students who would benefit from that kind of instruction then. So once again, you kind of see this careful coordination going on. The developmental education classes are not isolated. They're closely coordinated with the academic units. Well, here once again, we're in Texas, Texas State University, San Marcos. Once again, an institution uh, comprehensive sets of services. Notice on how faculty members are integral parts of the Student Learning Assistance Center. That's also another key feature that perhaps you've seen a number of times as we've moved through these examples is how the faculty members are key and involving them more within the uh, learning the assistance services I think helps them to buy in more. I come from a background of being heavily involved with supplemental instruction, a peer-led um, student support program in historically difficult classes. We never ended up serving a class that was not warmly supported by faculty members. And also, the more the faculty can be involved, we knew that the results were higher, more students would participate, and grades would uh, increase, and the dropout rates would decrease in those kinds of classes. You also notice another feature down here among many of these programs is that these programs have been certified by other professional associations in the field. For the example here, the tutor program has been certified at the highest level. There's three levels of rigor by the College Reading and Learning Association. You probably have noticed that with several of the other examples. Also, their certification programs are offered by the Association for the Tutoring Profession, the um, a National Association of Developmental Education, the National College um, Learning Center Association, among others. And I think that, once again, having external review, also being responsible for external standards has been really key for helping to increase the outcomes for the students. Well, here we've moved up to Iowa, Kirkwood Community College, a two-year public institution serving 12,000 students here. Noticing one of the key features here is that they have very high administrative placement for their learning services unit. You notice there that they basically have the same kind of reporting responsibility to the vice president as any of the other major academic units within the institution. Administrative support is so critical for making sure that the kind your resources and personnel and authority are given to their learning assistance and developmental education units here and you notice some of the other uh, features as well. Here's College of St. Mary, a very modest sized college up in Omaha, Nebraska. For them they end up calling it the Achievement Center. So not only do they offer traditional learning assistance services but also they're heavily involved in student retention. 
Particularly here you notice this program which is bundled together a variety of services including financial aid, mentoring, tutoring, academic monitoring, and academic assistance for mothers on public assistance. The learning center up there was absolutely key for being in a sense the hub for this constellation of services. Donnelly College, another private institution, Roman Catholic, two-year institution outside of uh, in Kansas City, 500 students. Notice once again that developmental level courses are integral parts of learning communities, and that's been a common feature we've seen several times. I think that really in the future, developmental level courses either will be carefully coordinated in their curriculum and their outcome expectations for students in those courses, and increasingly you'll see them involved, I believe, with more learning communities, and there is a wide variety of literature that helps you to explore that more. Community College of Denver, it's probably one of the most famous examples of where an institution has been able to have outstanding um, completion rates and achievement for students who have been admitted provisionally. These are, many of their students are developmental level enrollees in courses because of their uh, lack of preparation or they simply have atrophied their skills after being out in the workforce or other responsibilities until they resume their college education. Notice some of the key factors down here, and one of the, I think one of the most key ones is it's the institutional commitment. Enormous amounts of personnel, resources are placed into the program in order to make it successful. I mean, it's really not possible to be able to do all of these different things here in terms of the articulation, the computer-based learning, the integration here with learning assistance resources. All of these takes careful coordination, and for them, they don't shy away from it, many students who may have lower standardized ACT and SAT scores, and they have amongst the highest of completion rates for all community colleges in Colorado, even though their profile of students who they admit probably are among the lowest inside of Colorado. Adam State here in Colorado, I think the thing that I really noticed about this one was is notice the name of their uh, program in which learning assistance services are located. Look at the umbrella here, first year experience and engagement program. So not only do you have these traditional learning assistants, but it's actually located within the uh, first year experience and engagement. I think this really shows once again on how they bring together all these resources and they do bundling. And I think that that's also been another common feature that we've seen thus far. Stanford University, now we've traveled all the way over to the other side of the country here. A private institution, very prestigious, 15,000 students or so. And for them, they not only provide services for students, but also they have a very extensive faculty development opportunity. And I think that once again, it's showing on how not only do they serve faculty as consultants, they also are the major trainers for all of the teaching assistants on campus, and also they provide learning assistance services for students. They certainly have a high profile at their institution, the Center for Teaching and Learning. They don't have issues about stigma because for them, they're central to the institution. They're providing services for everyone on campus, including the faculty. Well, we've really been on a fast trip, haven't we? In a sense, you can see all the little pins there. Well, those are all the schools which we've illustrated as we've traveled across. It would have taken us four days and 20 hours to travel. I think we did this in the past 35 minutes or so here. So let's go ahead and take a look at what is it that seems to be recurring themes as we've looked at these institutions as well as others that I have been researching for the past 20 years as another professional in the field. Comprehensive approaches to support services. As you've noticed oftentimes disability services, academic advising, developmental level coursework, learning assistance centers, um, tutoring programs, small group, academic support programs, all are, co are all uh, coordinated together. Well, is there any common pattern on where these are located at? Student affairs, academic affairs? Well, there really isn't. It really doesn't make much difference. The key is, is where is this unit going to be the best funded and the best represented and the best supported? That's really the issue. It's not about whether it's best under student affairs, academic affairs, or retention services. 
Once again, you've noticed that a number of these programs have mentioned inside of the bullet points about how they've been certified. And I mentioned that before by College Reading and Learning Association, among many others. Just like we would have an expectation for every institution to be certified through one of the regional accrediting agencies, so too for us in the fields of learning assistance and developmental education, if there is a certification program for one of our components, I think anymore now we're really pretty much compelled to deal with that. And there's another two other good reasons for that. A, it improves the program and B, it increases the credibility of our programs in the eyes of the administrators to whom that we report. Extensive training and professional development is provided for staff. We just don't take students, really gifted students, wind them up, and then just send them off to provide tutoring or assistance for the semester without initial training, oftentimes anywhere from two days to a week of training, and then periodic, perhaps every other week, maybe every week, update workshops and training workshops for them throughout the entire semester. I think in many ways the job of a paraprofessional, whether it be a mentor, a faculty, excuse me, a student counselor, mentor, um, a student uh, assistant, a, a student who is um, serving as a tutor or is serving as a small group discussion leader, perhaps like with supplemental instruction or any of the other wide variety of peer assistance learning programs, I think it's one of the toughest jobs around. I think that these are highly gifted people, very knowledgeable in their field, but I think it's really difficult whenever they go inside of a learning space and they're by themselves with the other students who are highly anxious. I think those students who have been employed to work in our learning centers and such, they really need lots of development. It's also a wonderful professional development opportunity for them too. You've noticed also a number of times disability services are oftentimes included. I think it's another unit that we can, if not included within our center, that we need to develop strategic relationships with. And also there's a wide diversity of names that you probably noticed that. I mean, here's the list of all the names from our road show. You only have, as I'm looking here, there's only two names that were reproduced. The Center for Teaching and Learning was used at three institutions. Developmental Studies Department was used at two institutions. But look at all the diversity here. And I think in many ways it kind of shows on how our programs are continuing to increase our integration within the institution. It's another way for us to be able to deal with those old issues of stigma. Sometimes it is helpful to rename ourselves in order to be able to remission ourselves in the eyes of others. I did a research study a couple years ago looking at the mailing list for national members of the National Association of Developmental Education. And it wasn't surprising that the most common name uh, of the department of which NAID members came from was Developmental Education. But look at all the other names that are up here. The second biggest cluster were people who were located inside of the academic units. And then you end up looking at academic support, learning center, and the rest. I think what it tells us is that there's a great diversity out there in terms of the names. In fact, as I remember, there was 161 different names used to represent the uh, thousands of members of NAID. So I think that shows us that, as you can see, some less common names here. There was a lot of transition, and I think part of it reflects the local campus and institutional culture. What are some more features of similarities among these exemplary programs? Well, they serve a wide variety of students, everywhere from lower um, first year, second year students, all the way up through graduate and professional school. Everybody has needs. There is historically difficult classes located throughout the curriculum. In fact, organizations like the Noel Levis Centers for Student Retention would indicate that one of the most overlooked groups of students are students who are sophomores and juniors. Sometimes we pay lots of attention to first-year students. Then we oftentimes marshal lots of resources for graduate students. And then sometimes we just kind of leave out the students who are kind of average. They're there in the middle. And if they're not supported all the way through, then they quietly slip out of the institution and helps to explain part of the reason why the student retention rate or the completion rate for college still only hovers around about 50% or so for the past 100 years. 
And I think that we really need to have more opportunities for more services throughout the entire pathway of the education experience. Well, lots of integration you notice with these programs with student retention programs. A, I think that we're a valuable partner with that. B, that's also a place for us to be seen as more essential on the campus and I think can also help attract more funds for us to be able to provide more services for students. As I said, this integration also with first year experience courses, also serving uh, targeted student populations, for example, that one private institution was working with mothers. I think that once again we have an opportunity to really make a difference. Well once again there's lots of program assessment and evaluation within the programs. Many of these programs not only have been certified but on an annual basis conduct very detailed analysis of their programs and use that information in order to be able to help revise and improve their programs. And also many of them were very involved with learning communities. And I think that once again that's a pedagogy that is very appropriate for particularly developmental level courses to be integrated within. Well, which road should we take at this point? Well, it all kind of depends. The road that we need to take is based on your local institutional needs. It's really based on what is your need for student retention, what resources are available, so there really isn't any perfect program that was out there. You notice that they weren't all identical. They may have shared principles, but their expressions were very institutionally unique. And I think that there is no perfect program, so how are we going to know what to do? Well, there's a couple of books which I've always found very helpful to me, and those are by Stephen Covey. Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, and then a follow-up book that focuses on just one of those principles called First Things First. And what Dr. Covey argues is that sometimes we're so busy providing services that we don't take the time to plan for new services. We start getting into kind of a rut of doing the same old, same old. And what he argues is that we've got to budget some time. And that means maybe even turning down some time that we would spend in direct service with students so that we can do some strategic planning. So what he argues is that is that this quadrant up here kind of explains where we spend lots of our time. Too often times we spend all of our time in the urgent things. We're dealing with crises. We're on the telephone. Well, we've got to do some of those things. But sometimes we just simply have got to push beyond that and get over to what he calls the important, not urgent activities. And that's what he ends up calling quadrant two. And this is where we spend time on preparing clarifying what our values are, careful planning, developing relationships, building alliances. My application here is making sure that we are well known and well coordinated among the deans, whether it be academic, student affairs, student retention programs on campus, and also in a sense really trying to recreate ourselves. We need to continue to think about our centers, not only meeting today, but what are we going to be doing in meeting the needs of tomorrow and five years from now? Because it's going to take us years to get ready. And if we don't take that time now, we're not going to be in a proactive position to meet those student needs then. Well, it's been a delight carrying through on this quick travel across the United States. It's been my privilege to get a chance to meet wonderful leaders of these programs and many others in my couple of decades in higher ed. I'd love to continue the conversation with you. I hope you come and um, visit my website at arendelle.org. I've placed a lot of online documents there, web links to more resources. Feel free to give me a telephone call, also to um, uh, send me some email, and I'd love to keep up the conversation. I'd love to hear about your exemplary program, so I also I could share that news whenever I go out and have conversations with others. So once again, it's been a real privilege here, and it was a great privilege that College Reading and Learning Association invited me to share some remarks at the conference back in 2008. And also, by the way, in case you really enjoyed some of those um, scenes, those photographs of the fall leaves, that's whenever I gave the speech, was in, I think, October of 2008, there's a website that you can go to. 
and you can see the web address up here it's called freephoto.com and if you're using the photographs for non-commercial uh, purposes they just simply ask that you give an attribution just like I'm doing here and in a sense saying thank you for what they did and they have photographs in a wide variety of areas well once again it's been a privilege getting to share with you let's keep up the conversation take good care